any questions before we start? I don't think we're going to be super long. security that we have been hiding from you uh, up until now. So uh, cross-site scripting is the most prevalent vulnerability on the web. Uh, OWASP, the Open Web Application Security Project, so they're an organization of security people. Okay. Um, and they come up with every year a list of top, or every few years of the top 10 most prevalent vulnerabilities on the web. Of course, there's all kinds of controversy surrounding those, but cross-site scripting is usually always near the top. So, this is why I said that the same origin policy is one of the most key things to web security, and that is because fundamentally, what cross-site scripting means is that an attacker is able to bypass the same origin policy. So what would that mean? So just if they're able to bypass the same origin policy, so what would that mean that they could do? Yeah? Send some payload to their server, right, which is supposed to be blocked by the same origin. Payload? Uh, a request or whatever. A request? Access the database using index and you post some JavaScript, so which gets executed with the same origin. So let's think about this. What can so what can some JavaScript code running in the same origin do? So what can let's say Facebook.com's JavaScript do? It can send responses back to Facebook.com. What else? Access files on its server. It can try to make requests to files on that server. Oh. Access the C cert token. Access all of the access all the HTML that was returned from that page, including any types of tokens or forms. What else, what else can it read and look for? Cookies, it can read the cookies, right? So the core thing to think about is, okay, now if we're saying that JavaScript that an attacker controls is now able to execute in the same origin as Facebook, what capabilities do they have? And it's all of those things. Right? So the attacker could completely control the DOM of Facebook.com and completely change the layout. The attacker has access to the cookies that Facebook.com has access to. It can make requests, uh, as we'll see, all kinds of cool stuff. So this is the core. So at the core, if you can bypass the same origin policy, that really is what cross-site scripting is. We'll see that the name cross-site scripting is a bit of a misnomer. It doesn't really mean anything. The core is being able to bypass the same origin policy. So you can even do cool stuff like, I think back in the day, you used to be able to like trick the browser by using Unicode or something to think that the iframe you were loading was in a different same origin. Right? So you can try to find bugs in browsers based on how they compute the same origin to exploit those. That would be. I guess you probably wouldn't call those a cross-site scripting attack, but they would definitely have the same result of bypassing the same origin policy. So because we're scientists, we like to classify things into neat little categories and boxes. So here for cross-site scripting, we categorize them into two different ways. Reflected attacks, which is basically when, so we think about how, so now the question is, so we know the result is that cross-site scripting attacks bypass JavaScript's same origin policy. The question is how. So how does the browser, how does the browser assign a same, an origin to JavaScript code?
This is making me want to drop, but I didn't install the drivers, so I don't think it's going to work. So it depends on where the page comes from, right? So let's say, so this is why it's a little tricky just thinking about the JavaScript there. So let's, oh no, wait, come on. Oh yeah, that's nice. Okay. Alright. I promise I won't drop. is an inline JavaScript, what is the same origin domain of this JavaScript? <laughs> Example.com, AD, HTTP, right? So port, post, and, and uh, uh, host name, port, and protocol. Cool. So this definitely makes sense. Somebody said, hey, the JavaScript, wherever it's sent from, is here. Now, what happens if I do... saying, hey, go fetch this code from somewhere else, but execute it in my origin. So this code will be downloaded from google.com, but we execute it in the domain of example.com, http, and port 80. So this is the fundamental way to circumvent the same origin policy. Now, the browser, when the browser gets, let's say this is the HTML response that the browser gets. Right? How does the browser know which the inline JavaScripts and the external JavaScripts? Well, they're the same in the script. Yeah, how does it know? I mean, it's not a complicated answer. HTML parsing. Yes, yeah, all comes back to parsing. I keep harping on that because it's actually important. So it has to parse this HTML page. When it sees this script tag, it says, OK, I'm executing this script. And I know it's an internal script, so it's executing in the same origin. Great. Then when it gets here, it says, OK, this is an external script, but set this origin when we fetch this to be this same domain. So the same origin domain here would be http.example.com. Right? So. What happens 
So, okay, so fundamentally, the way an attacker, uh, sorry, sorry, the way we can circumvent the same origin policy is essentially either through external JavaScript code, right? But I guess the key question is what JavaScript code did the developer of example.com want us to execute? Can you tell? Why or why not? So, okay, I'm trying to, I'm trying to, I'm trying to build this somewhere, but I can't tell because there's just a link there. Right. So fundamentally, the browser has absolutely no way to know which script tags the developer intended for there to be versus which ones were maybe injected by a, an attacker. So let's say the, let's say this is a PHP script that looks something like this, super simple, echo, get, So is this valid PHP code? I mean, it's a terrible program, I guess, so fine. We'll be, it's not very good, we'll just throw our own HTML tags. Just be good people. Right, so super, stupid simple, but something that just hopefully will illustrate a point. So, this is the code. If we access user foo, what HTML are we gonna get? Just something like this, with this replace with boom. Now, when we look at the PHP code, what JavaScript did the developer want us to execute? It pulled the request and the None. Zero JavaScript code, right? There's absolutely no JavaScript code in this PHP function, right? Now, what if we wanted to execute some JavaScript code? What can we put in as the value for the foo, uh, for the u variable? Uh, uh, script tags. Uh, and then code inside it. Yeah, so we can use script tags. Now, is this correct? Can we just send this? What do we need to do? Yeah, we need to URL and code this U parameter, but let's say that it's already done. Right? Then now the question is, what exactly is this PHP code going to do? Yeah, replace the foo with whatever we passed in here, which is this script tag. And then when your browser gets this response, what's it going to do? It's going to parse it, and then it's going to execute the things inside those script tags. And then it's going to show an alert box. So that JavaScript code that got executed, right, it's executing in the, it's in the origin of HTTP example.com 80. But where did that code come from? Did it come from the developer of example.com? No, it came from, well, here it's coming from the parameter, but, well, now if I wanted as an attacker to get you to execute code in the domain of example.com, what could I do? Yeah. And then how do you get me to execute that? Send the URL to me and trick me to click on it, right? So send me an email that says, oh, hey, I found some students cheating in your class, and then link me to this. <laughs> Immediately as I said it, I was like, yeah, that would get me to click on a link, <laughs> right? So this is an important distinction here. So, and would I click on a link that looks like this? Hopefully not. So what did you do to obfuscate it? Do you use a shortener like bit.ly or something like that? What else? Character encoding. Encode everything, including the script and the alert, everything. Right? That would actually super, you, you're actually used to getting these emails from websites that are just these 
URL encoded huge garbage strings. And then with, well, okay, I won't get into that. Um, so this is an example of what we call reflected cross-site scripting. So the idea is the cross-site scripting payload is taken from a URL parameter and is being used and displayed back to the user. So in order to, so I guess we should, so do you guys, if you're an attacker, do you think you could get somebody to click on a reflected cross-site scripting link? Yeah, pretty easily. So that's part of the way we think of the threat model of the web. An attacker can basically try to force you to go to any website, right? I mean, it's not really forcing, but eventually they, they I've seen crazy things. This is actually how they did some of the attacks. I think it was the Aurora attacks against Google is they figured out who worked on the team they wanted to get on. Then they figured out where their Facebook accounts were, created somebody who was an account of somebody that they knew who was not on Facebook and then friended them through there and then sent them a link uh, on like during work hours to their Facebook. Of course, they were on Facebook. And then they clicked on that link on their work computer and then went to a site that infected their browser through a drive-by download attack and executed malware on their machine. And that's how they originally got into the network. So yeah, clicking, uh, clicking links is bad. It actually also works the other way. So there have been cases of people law enforcement and the FBI finding out who bad guys are because they infiltrate like IRC and different organizations and then get people to click on links that then expose their, um, their IP addresses. So yeah, be careful out there. But it's part of the threat model of the web, right? So we can essentially get anyone to click on any link at any time. So, and normally the way you think about these are some kind of error message or a search field. I mean, these are the kind of standard ways that these reflected cross-site scripting can, can occur. Anything that includes the server's response, the includes the cross-site scripting payload as part of the request to the web server. Now, what would be the flip side of reflected? I mean, not literally the opposite word of reflected. I don't know what that is. Yeah, so what, what would be a type? Like, how would you describe something that is not a reflection? Transmission. Injected. Yeah, so it's, describe it. What, what, is, what would it be? You said injected? That's it? Yeah. A thought, a one word thought? Yeah. Uh, maybe you could uh, store the uh, script in a database feed, and when the database feed is loaded uh, on a get request, it will execute that script. Exactly. So think about like any, uh, let's say a web page that is, um, um, what am I thinking of? Web page, vulnerable, scripts. Oh, 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 like a comment page on, let's say, items on Amazon, right? When you make a comment, that comment is stored by Amazon, and every time somebody visits that page, right, that comment is going to be displayed. So let's say they're, that they're, um, that there's a cross-site scripting vulnerability there. Now you as an attacker inject your cross-site scripting payload. The web application stores that and sends that to every single person that requests that page. So let's step back for a minute and let's think, how do we fix vulnerable.php? How do we fix this code? What does the developer likely intend? Does the developer intend for people to be able to input arbitrary HTML tags here? Probably not. I mean, sanitize. Yeah. Sanitize how? What kind? Sanitize that percent ends? No, we need to do sanitization on each of the tags as well. Yes. So the key problem is so. Anybody uh, PHP? Is it just HTML entities? Yeah. <laughs> special charts. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not at <adding> baby. <laughs> so you're not at home job yet. So by doing this, now what will be the output if I try this payload? What does HTML special characters do? Is this going to change? Is this going to change? It's going to replace 
this like the it's not going to interpret the script tag as a script tag. It'll just interpret it as that text How? by escaping um, all the HTML characters. So the less than, the greater than, and yeah. That's all. So the, the web application, the PHP code, is making, uh, essentially doing a string replace on any of these special characters with the HTML entity encoding version of those special characters. So now, when the browser gets this response and it sees this ampersand LT semicolon, what does it do? What does it interpret that as? Does it say that's the start of a script tag? What does it say? This is the start of the less than character, right? This is text as the less than character. And it'll keep going. So you will actually see in the HTML of this page will look, it will be a start script tag. It will say alert, tick, XSS, tick, and then an ending script tag. So you will actually see that as text, right? If we get the distinction here, this is super important. Okay. Cool. So sort attacks are very similar. The dip, so the payload is still going to be the same. The difference is in how it gets transmitted to the users. So stored cross-site scripting, basically the ejection code is permanently part of the web application now. So it is part, well, it's not part of the application's code. It's part of the data of the application, and it will get sent for every single request. Um, I actually remember seeing these, gosh, way back in the day on GeoCities. I remember GeoCities had like guest books. And I found out at some point that if you put in like HTML tags, it would completely just ruin the rest of the guest book. But I never knew what that meant until much, much later studying this and being like, oh, that's essentially what was happening. Like if you did a, an end HTML tag, it would basically ignore all the other guest book comments. Um, yeah. So the other third way, so the important thing here, the way I like to think about these, these first two, where is the vulnerability in this code? The server side, in the PHP code, right? And again, if we go back to here, this is exactly the same problem that we had in cross-site scripting, right? In cross-site scripting, we had PHP code concatenating together strings in order to send to a SQL query. But here, we're concatenating together strings to send where? To the browser, right, as part of the HTTP response. So here, we're essentially concatenating strings together, and we're doing it in an unsafe way, where the user's data, what should be data, will be interpreted as code by the browser. So there's an important distinction, and it's important that in both cases, the vulnerability exists on the server. So if I can go back, I call both of these server-side cross-site scripting because that's where the vulnerability is. And because that contrasts with the third type of cross-site scripting vulnerability, and that's DOM-based cross-site scripting, which is, well, so the idea is, so JavaScript, as we talked about, has lots of different functionalities. One of these is an eval function. What does the eval function do? takes string, which is you know, a string text, and turns it and executes it as code, interprets it. <coughs> and so now if the attacker can control that JavaScript, right? like let's say it grabs one of the parameters and takes that and then injects that into the page or just calls eval on it, right? now we can put arbitrary code in that parameter. And now that is a cross-site scripting vulnerability. But where's the, where does the actual vulnerability lie? Can you fix this with changes to the server-side code? No, because the server-side code isn't vulnerable, right? The server-side code is not the thing that's turning text into actual code. The vulnerability exists on the client side. So I like calling these client-side cross-site scripting because to me, this makes much more sense because it takes a completely different mindset to think about these DOM-based cross-site scripting. Oh, I do have examples. Okay, cool. We'll look at another example maybe of DOM-based XSS. 
So reflected cross-site scripting would be something like this, as we saw. So if we go here, we have Adam, we can see it here. If we do reflected XSS, it'll say XSS here. So yes. by, by sending out that uh, page, you put your clients at risk for... Um, Which page? This page? To, like in a client side, cross-site mm -hmm. scripting vulnerability, you're putting your clients, the clients of your site at risk to getting attacked by... Yes, so any so for any cross-site scripting vulnerability, right? The end people who are gonna be affected are your users. Right? So the question is where does the vulnerability exist? Does it exist in the server-side code because it is incorrectly generating an HTTP response? Or does the vulnerability exist in the JavaScript code? Let's go with an example. I actually don't remember we're gonna have an example. So let's look at one. Well, let's write one. So I'm going to go to this page, and it's going to give me a constant output, right? So nothing, so it's going to give me nothing fancy, right? There's nothing in here. Um, it's not doing any server-side processing of code. It's always giving me a constant output. Uh, but let's say this one does something silly, and it does, and this one I'm going to need people's help. Uh, what is it, location? How do you get everything that's after the hash? I think it's just location.hash, right? Yeah. Right, let's say this is a search term. I don't know, whatever. It doesn't matter. Something like this. So let's say here it's like this. So we talked about which part is this in the URL, in the URI? The fragment. What's interesting about the fragment? What is it used for? Jumping to the server side page. Sub resource identification. Yeah, so identifying, so remember a URI specifies a resource. The hash, everything after the hash represents the fragment, which is the sub resource. So what part of that resource? Realistically, it's used mostly in your browsers um, because if there's an element with this same ID. So if you have an, a DOM element with an attribute ID equals foo, it will automatically scroll down to have that be where foo is. Now, the super interesting thing is browsers, because they know that the fragment um, is only meant for the client side, right? It only affects the user agent. Your browser never sends the fragment part to the server. So when you make a request for this page, the web server is only going to see a request for example.com slash dom.html. That's it. So what this means is, so now if I wanted to execute code, do I do this? Can I do this? Here, no, why no? You don't need the script tags. What? You don't need the script tags. Why? Because you're evaluating JavaScript code. Not right, HTML. because this is not valid JavaScript code, right? This is the HTML to start a JavaScript code. Everything between these tags is valid JavaScript code. So how would I change it? Get rid of those script tags. Get rid of those script tags. So now here, the problem is there's a vulnerability in the JavaScript code I'm sending to the client. And the super interesting thing part about here, and it's kind of a fine distinction, but when I sent this request, what did the what did example.com see as the URI I was trying to access? The entire thing with the script tags, right? So the example.com could actually be looking at their logs to try to see if there's any types of attacks like these. And actually, but on the flip side, you're going to be attacked like this all the time. So it's kind of a fool's errand to look at all of them. But at least you have a log of this happening somewhere. What does example.com see in this, this case? DOM.html and nothing else. So they don't see any of this attack on the user. Cool. There's also other interesting distinctions. 
distinctions here. Is there a question? Yeah. Uh, apart from the URL parameters, is there any other way uh, through which we can inject some script in the event? Yeah. Uh, actually. Oh, you mean for here? Yeah. Yes. So this could be anything. This could be, uh, I've seen, there's crazy examples of like getting tweets on a topic, like taking a tweet or something and then calling eval on it. Or getting your user preferences as a JSON object and instead of parsing it as JSON, calling eval. And maybe they're not encoding your value correctly when sending it back. Um, that, I've actually seen that one in a pen test that I did. Was they, your preferences were, they posted, I think, as like an object, but they weren't validated as an object. And you were sent back whatever you sent back and they called eval on that. So you could create this object that had additional code after it so it would do basically two things. Um, that was a really fun one. Uh, so, so in order for this to be vulnerability, you'd want to get someone to click on that link? Correct, just like in the reflected case. So you could, and that's also where it breaks down a little bit. So you could have a DOM-based XSS that is stored because the JavaScript code is fetching it from a server. You could have it where it's reflected, where it's getting those parameters. You could have, you could, well, there is kind of this category of what they call self XSS, where uh, like, let's say it was the cookie value, right? Like to set a cookie, you have to be JavaScript executing in that same origin. So it'd be very difficult to get somebody else to set a cookie on your behalf, unless you found this other weird functionality of the website that allowed you to influence the cookie value. I mean, that, that could be possible. Yeah, cross-site scripting is a huge, deep rabbit hole that you can go down into. There's something else important here. Yeah, They're doing something incredibly simple, which is they look at the URLs. If any, if any of the um, URL parameters are have script tags that are exactly the same as script tags in the response, they'll block that script tag from executing. So yeah, they do have very basic protection mechanisms against these super simple reflected and cross-site scriptings, but not always. I mean, and not all browsers, and not in the same way, and there still can be ways even around that. So you can try to evade those in various interesting ways. Cool. Sweet. I think we did all this. Oh, yes. So the other thing is, so when we talk about attacks, right, we talk about, okay, what can the attacker do with this capabilities, right? So um, if you think about from the attacker's perspective, do they want to send you inline JavaScript? Why or why not? It could be big. What was that? It could have a lot of text. It could be really large depending on what you want to do. Yeah, that would be one. What would be another one? What if they made a mistake? You guys never make mistakes? True. It allows them to edit it. They can change over time. Yeah, so if we do, if we inject instead of an inline JavaScript, we inject an external JavaScript to something that we wrote. Now that will be fetched and executed from each of the browsers that we exploit. We also may be able to get their IP address that way, we may be able to get other information about them. The downside is it gives them a place to kind of block and stop our attack because we have to put some kind of source that we get in here. But maybe we can point it to like a, um, you can use like a GitHub GIST or something like this, like a, a random one or something like that. Uh, there's probably ways to get around that. Okay, so what can we do, right? So we can, as 
we saw we can we talked about we can steal cookies. If we steal cookies, then then what? We can authenticate as that user. We can try using those cookies to authenticate to that user to the website. Exactly. What else could we do? That's it. We could try you just to want access, to steal cookies. We could try to access some information in the database using their. So what do you mean in the database? Can we talk to the database directly? No, but we, we, if we were there, had their user credentials. But well, we don't have their user credentials. We're executing in JavaScript. Yeah. You can do basically anything the user can do? We can do anything the user can do on that website, exactly, right? Because we can make AJAX requests to that website. It's asynchronous requests. And every asynchronous request we make to that website, the browser will automatically send along the cookie. And so the server says, hey, looks like this user is pressing this link or is requesting this resource, great, give them whatever they want. So we can fundamentally perform any action on the website that the user could perform. So this is insane, right? You, so this means any JavaScript code executing on your browser, we could, uh, what was that oh, any JavaScript code that's executing in like facebook.com could do anything that you could do on Facebook. You can post on your wall, it can post uh, on people, it can message people, it can literally do anything you can do, right? The same thing with um, in your bank. If any JavaScript code is executing there, they can transfer money, they can do all kinds of nasty things, right? Which, and it's coming from your IP too, right? If you steal their cookie, they may be checking IPs. What if I wanted more permanent access? How can I get more permanent access? What you're talking about? Uh, you could get their password How? and username by uh, using the browser. So browser may store it, but you probably can't access it from JavaScript. It's a sandbox. Get access to the database. What was that? Get access to the database. What database? Steal their cookie. You can steal their cookie, but that's not, maybe they're going to wipe out their session or maybe the session's only for like a day. Yeah. I could create a pop up which asks for a password and then track the password. Mm, so you can create a pop up that asks for their username and password? That's good. What else? Uh, you can uh, request for a reset password. And mm. the reset password page usually asks for an email ID to send the reset link. Uh, but a reset password would have to go to their email address. So I don't think you as an attacker would be able to see that unless you can somehow influence where it got sent. Maybe you could, using the application, change their email address associated with their account and then reset their password. Yeah. Uh, could you log their keystrokes if you got the script on like a login page? And then you could definitely log their keystrokes on a login page. But to go up with, so to follow up with a pop up, pop up's a good starting point, but a pop up would be suspicious. Right, because a pop up, you know, no website pops up uh, for using passwords except for terrible like SharePoint sites and ASU. But what you could do, you have total control of the DOM. So you can change the DOM of the page to be exactly like the login page of the website. And what's even more insane, because this is happening over, let's say, HTTPS you'll still get the green lock because all of that code is actually coming from that website, right? I almost said the name of the website that we did this to, um, right? But the page will look like the login page. The only thing that will be different will be the URL bar at top, right? And again, you can encode that so it looks maybe more legitimate, right? So imagine somebody sends you a link to let's say facebook.com, you click, you go to something that's facebook.com, but it has the, um, but it's a login page, so you log in, you fill in the form, you hit enter, and when you hit enter, the JavaScript code now goes, or maybe it's key logging it, it goes in, it looks at the form, grabs your username and password, sends it to the attacker, and then goes and submits the form to the real login, so now you're actually logged into Facebook once you get in. Yeah, all kinds of fun games you can play. And that way, now with username and password, you can get in forever. Like, it's not limited to a certain time frame. Cool. Ah, so I have an example. So yeah, I can send, so 
I've done this before, not for Facebook.com, but for another domain. It is super cool because uh, it looks exactly, I mean, it literally is. You use the HTML content and all the style sheets of that website to make a login form that looks 100% identical to their own site. And then, oh, I have my email address tonight, that's nice. <laughs> I realize that, it's been here for years. Um, and then, so all I have to do is basically encode this here, and URL encode all this, and it would look like kind of random gibberish. And maybe I could put something before this, like login.php and then something, right? Or I could change the link, the URL link. So you can do really cool stuff here. So stored cross-site scripting, the idea is essentially we talked about a two-stage attack, right? So you first, the JavaScript code that the attacker wants to be executed, the attacker themselves sends it to the server in an HTTP request. The web application stores it usually in a database, but it could be a file or anything like that. Then the victim downloads and executes the code when another person views that page. So all kinds of things are vulnerable to this. Um, stored XSS are really, really bad. And you actually get into this really interesting circumstance if you mix a social platform with a stored cross-site scripting vulnerability. So there was a case a long while ago, back when MySpace was actually still a thing, where a security researcher found a stored cross-site scripting on the profile pages of MySpace that anytime you visited an infected profile, would change your profile to include that code that would infect people. And it would also add this, and Sammy is my hero, to the bottom of the page. <laughs> and so you see, like, in the span of 24 hours, like, a millions of people had this, and Sammy is my hero, at the bottom of their profile. So this thing is spread throughout the network. This also happens with Twitter, cross-site scripting vulnerabilities every once in a while. So Twitter will have something like this and it will just spread throughout the network because of course the first thing you do is you write a tweet that includes this thing, right? And then anyone else who sees that that's vulnerable writes a tweet and then it spreads virally throughout the network. Okay, so JavaScript. So actually getting to JavaScript execution is not always as simple as we have here of script tags. So often web applications perform some kind of filtering or sanitization mechanisms, and if they're the only way to be 100% secure is to use something like this, HTML special characters. Kind of, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, but there's a lot of different ways that we can execute JavaScript. So we can, uh, there is now a, a um, there is a cross-site scripting cheat sheet that you can go to that has a bunch of different cross-site scripting payloads, each that have different characters and different types of things. Um, you may not be able to use single quotes or double quotes, so how do you get around that? Um, all kinds of cool filters on there. There's also very interesting when you start digging around in there, because some of these payloads are specific to specific browser versions, so why is that? Yeah, so each browser implements HTTP, I'm sorry, HTML parsing differently, right? And so depending on what browsers do in the case of errors, maybe they do something that you can actually take advantage of. And so this would be a simple type of thing. We can encode it, so maybe encoding we can get around. There may also be a web application firewall in the way. We can inject so the other cool thing is we may not even need script tags at all. So if somebody's filtering on script tags, like the script keyword, uh, we can use body. So the body tag has an on load event, an attribute that that value is JavaScript. So whatever's inside there will be interpreted and executed as JavaScript when the body tag loads. Super interesting one, let's say maybe we can use bold tags. If we use the on mouse over event, this is a JavaScript event that will fire when the mouse goes over that part of the page. And so then whatever's inside the value of that attribute will execute. What's the downside here? They have to mouse over it. Yeah, they have to mouse over it. So how can you help them? You make it span the whole page. Yes, so this is actually a super cool thing to do. You make it, uh, you can use sty uh, CSS style sheets to make that element 
be the entire width of the page, and you can even make it transparent so they can still look at the rest of the page. And then as soon as they, I think right when you go to the page, if you don't move the mouse, it won't fire, but you move the mouse any pixel and that thing will fire, which is a lot of fun to play with. And then you can even have the JavaScript get rid of this element now, so you don't have multiple events firing. So you can do anything in JavaScript. So you can then move that away, and so now the page looks exactly the same. Uh, this is actually one of the easiest ways of doing this, that you get this auto-loading behavior. So the idea is you create an image tag, you create a source, usually you want to, you can put it to some file that doesn't exist, and then image tags have an on error handler, which will trigger whenever there's an error loading some of the content, and so that is JavaScript code in there that will run when there's an error. So you want to basically include the image source to something that doesn't exist, because when it doesn't exist, that's when the error handler gets triggered. And so this will happen automatically. Yeah, you can even sometimes use interesting, like you can try UTF-8 encoding part of this JavaScript. Um, you can even do this with, uh, so it seems like you need single quotes or double quotes, but you can actually execute arbitrary JavaScript without, like you can do all of this without any single or double quotes in here. So here I'm creating a string from a regular expression in JavaScript. So it's turning this into the string Adam, and it's alerting that up. Um, so lots of cool stuff. And this is, like I said, this, this gets really, really complicated. Okay, DOM based. So yeah, the other term is third order. I don't know that we talk about that necessarily, but I prefer client side XSS. Ah, here we go, perfect. So this, ah, so this is an interesting different example. So here, we're setting the name to be the location.hash, and then we're writing out using document.write hello name. So what does document.write do? It writes what? The document model. Yes, so it, it's, it's writing to the document, and what does the browser then do with what's written? Parses it as HTML. Yes, which means any script tags in there will be parsed and executed as well. So if we went to something like this, uh, example.com, test that HTML, hashtag Adam, it will be go here into name, and then we'll print out hello Adam. So it will write out the document hello Adam. Now if we go to example.com, test that HTML, hash the script. Now, why in this case did we need to use the script tags versus in the previous DOM we needed to just do the alert? What was it? Yes, because we're using document.write, the HTML parser is parsing the page, whereas eval assumes that it's going to be JavaScript code that it's parsing. Cool. Ah, yes. So the wormable cross-site scripting that I talked about, so there's a case in 2005 was the Sandy is my hero case. Uh, TweetDeck, is, there was a vulnerability in the TweetDeck application in 2014 that allowed a wormable cross-site scripting vulnerability. Oh, so this is cool. So, so the Sandy is my hero had a, uh, he wrote a blog post all about what he found. And so if you look, this is a screenshot from back then. If you look, you'd see all these examples of this uh, Sandy is my hero. And then you can see this one here is tech support back forms. My state has got hacked. Question mark, question mark. Um, and then even on MSN search, which is a huge flat pack, is Sandy is my hero. And so, oh, the other thing that they would do with him is they would all friend him, Sammy. So all the JavaScript code would not only propagate themselves, but also friend him. And so he has almost a million friend requests here, almost as popular as Tom. Um, so cross-site scripting is a huge rabbit hole, and actually as we're drawing to the close here now, we may, uh, well, we'll talk about it in a second, but we may go more into depth in here. We can look at all kinds of cool uh, 
weird type of XSS payloads and those kind of stuff. But um, fundamentally, cross-site scripting is incredibly difficult to prevent. Why? Turn on the client side and not have a wait. Client side is incredibly difficult. So even thinking about client side cross-site scripting is incredibly difficult. But even just server side cross-site scripting is difficult. But why is that difficult? What was that? Yeah, any, every, just like SQL injection, right? Every time you use user input in a query, it must be sanitized. Similarly, whenever you're using user input in an HTML response back to the browser, or back to the browser, which is almost all the time, right? A lot of your content is going to be made based on user input. Now, any of that can be used as a cross-site scripting attack. So it's incredibly difficult to prevent because every single piece of data that came from the user, right? And this is where we talked about the in injection vectors in a web application. Not only all the parameters, but also post parameters, cookies, request headers, anything from the database contents, anything from a file. I actually found uh, back, I don't remember, I think it was probably, I don't know, oh, I don't know. there used to be this web music service called lala.com that was eventually bought by Apple, which eventually became Apple Music. It was the streaming music service, and so I was using it, and I found out that they had this functionality to upload your own music file, and then I saw it would get included in the website, so I was like, I wonder if I make a, a, a name of a song as script tags, like an alert, and I did it, and it worked, and so I got code execution there, and then I was able to create a playlist so that I could send people the link to that playlist and then it would be basically a stored cross-site scripting on anybody who visited that playlist. Um, and then I emailed them and I literally never heard from them ever. And then they were bought by Apple, so I'm sure they could care less. And that entire website went away. It's actually a really cool model because they had this thing where you could stream music for like 10, you could unlimited, you can stream any song once and you can do unlimited streaming for like 10 cents. So you could just like buy albums for a dollar or so. I don't know. It's, uh, it was an interesting model. Anyways, this goes into the file content. Literally any place that user input is used, right? And it doesn't need to be to that application. It could be anything else. They're pulling in any third party content. Languages. So this is actually what gets to be incredibly difficult. So let's go to the, okay, I want to go to the example. So we go here. So the solution here is pretty simple. We talked about it. HTML special characters. Okay. So let's think about a different page. Let's say it like this. We'll still say, we'll do this. first should be yeah, right? Because I took something that was safe, right? I'm using the correct sanitization function, and I just moved it, right? But I didn't move the code itself. Where did I move it? Uh, 
class so a single quotes, so I can change my example. <coughs> successfully perform a cross-site scripting attack even though they're using sanitization, what seems to be correct sanitization. So what's the problem? You need some sort of escape for the ID equals for whatever you're setting up attack, uh, attitude equals to. Yeah, so Fundamentally, well, the ID, so the problem is, right, when the user input was being output in between tags, right, like here, what the attacker needs to execute JavaScript is an opening script tag, right? Fundamentally, you can actually fix that by just changing every less than symbol to ampersand LT semicolon. Maybe. That may not be 100%. I don't know, maybe, can't remember. But anyways, that's the character they need, right? They need a less than symbol in order to transition the parser to start interpreting a script tag. But here, now when I move that exact same code to here, what does the attacker need to break out of where I wanted them to be? A single quote, which they may not be which the sanitization that I'm using may not be encoding correctly. So this is actually, I, I really believe, is the fundamental reason why cross-site scripting is still so prevalent today and still occurs even on Google, Google products, right? I believe it is really this issue. So it's not only that you need to sanitize all of the user input, but you need to sanitize them for the context they are used in the HTML that you're generating. So things that are used in an attribute need to be sanitized differently than things that are in between tags. Let's look at another example because I actually really like these examples. So 
So has anybody ever written code similar to this? It's okay, you don't have to. Never gonna be afraid. So. So what's the purpose of this code? Why would somebody write code like this? It's easy. It's easy to do what? But what's the what? Like, why are they doing? Like, what is the purpose of writing code like this? I know in this style, it's easy. Yeah. So I think the general concept is to put some value that the server knows into your JavaScript code to make it more dynamic. Exactly. So the idea is like the username, like putting the person's username into a JavaScript variable that JavaScript can use to manipulate or do something like this. The good-ish way to do this would be to have a JSON endpoint or some JavaScript object that you can fetch to get all these values, as we'll see. Um, but here, this is a very natural thing to do. You're essentially passing some data that the server side code knows and trying to pass it to the client side code that's going to execute on the user's browser. There's a hand. Yeah. Uh, for JavaScript, you cannot execute the. Execute JavaScript what? JavaScript loads after the PHP has rendered the page. Correct. So this cannot run it. Right. So that so that when a user fetches and, and requests this page. Right? The PHP code will look at whatever the U parameter is of get. So like let's go over a, a, a non-XSS. <coughs> Who do you guys end up now? So when we make this request, is this what we're gonna get back? No, why not? The PHP code executes at that point, then it gets this parameter here, CSC 545, gets the value here, passes it through the HTML special characters function, which doesn't change it at all, and then it passes the echo function, which outputs it, which means this entire thing is going to get replaced with this. So this is the result that our server, our browser will see back. Right? The server doesn't know about any of the PHP code that's happening. And now this JavaScript code, I guess I should add like a dot 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 here. Right, because this is not interesting in and of itself. But there's you know something else here that's trying to execute and do various things here. Right. So now how do we exploit this? And can we exploit this? Yes. How? HTML special characters will make sure that all of my script tags are turned into uh, HTML entities, exactly. So this would not work. So we can, I mean, I don't want to do it and do all the other ones, but you, this, you, can, you can write this code. You can actually run these programs, right? It's not, it's not very difficult. So that's not going to work. So then what do I do? Can I just do this? What do I do with this? the JavaScript parsing, right? Because JavaScript is going to parse this and it's going to say, okay, we have a variable name and it's being sent to this string. Great. This is valid JavaScript. Code. 
So now, how do I get it to actually execute my alert function? Yes. Try using something inside evil and close with two single quotes and plus so you concatenate something with evil. So the plugin great, you can say something. I don't know what it is. Uh, so just write a single quote plus evil and then your JavaScript code and then end it with plus and single quote. Like that? Get this in here, and then put this in here. So what's gonna happen? So are we gonna call alert one? Yes, we'll still call it first though. So we'll try to concatenate these strings together. We'll call the eval function, but before we do that, we'll call alert one, which I think will return null or undefined. And so we'll try to eval the string undefined, which I don't, and we'll probably do nothing. So we actually don't even need this eval here, right? Because, because why? Why don't we need the eval? Yeah? Uh, it's going to run alert one as a function because it's JavaScript. Because we are injecting into JavaScript code, exactly. We are already executing JavaScript. So we get rid of this, get rid of this. We'd also need to, no, not you again. <laughs> We'd also need to make sure we URL and close these pluses, otherwise they would end up as spaces. It's supposed to be something super important. But we'd see something like this. And so now we'd be able to execute, so let's say we don't want to do alert one, we don't want to do the pluses, we want to execute some arbitrary statements, what would we do? Yeah, do semicolons. So, I use a semicolon, I can do alert one, I can do alert two. But then what do I do afterwards? So just like SQL injection, everything that I put will be appended to my query. Yeah, so I can comment it out. That would be a super easy way to do this. So I would go into here. And so, Oh, but see, this is going to fail, right? Because we have this, well, it'll have this single quote all the way over to here, right? So we didn't actually execute anything. So you know, you're, I, I didn't include that character. So we're good. Okay, <laughs> name is there. Alert one, alert two, alert whatever we want, as much JavaScript as we want in here. And then this will comment out the rest of this code, and so we're good to go. So this is kind of what I consider as dynamic JavaScript. So, you're, so this is not a DOM-based cross-site scripting. Why? Exactly, the JavaScript code itself is not turning a string into code. Where is the problem then? PHP. PHP code, exactly. And this PHP code needs to know that this context that it's in is not in between two, text, two HTML tags. It's not inside of an attribute tag. It is actually inside of a JavaScript variable which means different escaping than all of those other ones combined. Cool. Okay, yes. I'm not gonna go into all of these. Because this kind of says in much more verbose way of what I just said here. Um, so all of these different, this kind of lists all the different contexts that con contexts? I think it's context. Context that you can have JavaScript. Um, and that, sorry, that you can use user input in HTML and different characters that must be escaped depending on the context. Uh, yeah, super interesting. So, oh, there we go. Cool. All right, oh, so the other one, there is a really good prevention cheat sheet. The key about preventing JavaScript is you should never try to do it on your own. So you should go back to the so part of the problem is oftentimes people want people to use some HTML, right? They want people to be able to write bold tags or write links or something like that, but they don't want them to be able to execute JavaScript code. But that's a very difficult problem, and it's very hard to get right. So you're much better off 
working with blacklists. Okay. Cool. Any questions on cross-site scripting stuff? All right. And what do you want to do on Monday? Review. Review? That's lame. What do you want to review? <laughs> well, how do you want to do review then, if you want to review? I'm not going to. You can ask questions. So this is what I was thinking. We could either do, I could either prep something about, let's say, XSS or SQL injection, or maybe I could talk about current modern defenses against all these things. I could talk about like click jacking or frame jacking. I could talk about attacks like this. Or we could do maybe in-class web hacking or something. Like I can set something up and we can try to pen test like a web app. I think that one sounds fun, right? Less work for me and you know, lots of fun for everyone. Okay, so bring, and that could be good prep for the midterm. So bring, uh, bring your laptop. I'll try to send out an email, but bring your laptop, install Docker on it if you can, because I have the um, vulnerable web app I wrote for the Why Johnny Can't Hand Test paper, the Wago Pico that we can use and play with. So uh, that should be really fun. So we'll do that on Monday.